Addiction. For some of us, it's a very foreign concept. We're not quite able to grasp the stronghold a drink, drug, food, bet, or even sexual encounter can have on an individual. In Canada, it's estimated that approximately 21% of the population will meet the criteria for addiction in their lifetime. Addiction has the ability to ruin lives on every level, and yet, even at the darkest of times, there is hope and the hope for many is really all they need. CAPSA, the Community Addictions Peer Support Association, has a vision where individuals affected by addiction have access to support when seeking help without stigma or discrimination, where recovery-focused services and support are based on collaborations and partnership, and where everyone is welcome. Behind CAPSA is Gord Garner, a former drug addict himself, and what I'd like to think of, uh, a man on a mission. So welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, as always, you can head to extensionmarketing.com. I think I said uh, before we kind of get into this, this is this is a heavier topic for me, the first one of this kind that I'm doing. But Gord, I'm really, I'm really happy to have you here. Well, thanks, Leanne. And we'd actually try to normalize the conversation to realize, as you said, so many people have this issue uh, that we see that part of this is just the inability to talk about. And I, I know it's early on, but I just want to make one note. I, I think of myself as a person with a substance use disorder. I uh, don't use the term addict uh, because when we have a label, it can really lock us into that. I used to call myself that for many years. So it's a very common term. Right. I, I remember there was a story of, of a friend of yours kind of looking at going and seeing that word addict and saying to you, this is this is what we are. Uh, or but I can see that it's a strong word it's a strong word so uh, we've done this with mental health over the last 10 years where we some people living with depression I'm a person with a schizophrenic uh, diagnosis I'm I'm not my diagnosis and so we uh, we do that to bring the person into the picture often the behaviors or the drugs uh, don't change but as long as we see the person we can hold our compassion a lot easier than if we name them or label them there's going to be a lot of, I think, learning uh, for, for me too in terms of the language and the understanding. And I, the the part of when I looked at the CAPSA w- website was really the words integrate, empower, recover. And before we started the podcast, I, I was trying to get a grasp of, of what your life was like because you started pretty much at around 18, drug use. Yes. By 19. By, by 19. We're completely it was... dependent. Yeah, and, and without even knowing, it was just just something I did. I had that in, uh, in mortality of youth, and I could wake up in the morning and I could go to work. Right, but youth and life and aging, this was part of you. You, you were 56 when you were able to, I get get your stronghold on this. Like... That was a lifetime. I'm thinking 19 to 56. That's been a long life of this. Yes, for sure. I mean, in a, a long, desperate life with great moments in between the desperation, you know, a lot of rallies, a lot of love and affection. I had a lot of friends. Uh, but in the end, you know, I think there's a song like that, in the end, I'm alone, my friend. And so, uh, and without... Without blaming my friends for departing, I, I wasn't, you couldn't let me in your home. I didn't want to be who I was, but I was who I was. And, it, I, and you know, I, I sought treatment uh, for the first time. By the, by the time I was 30, I, I, was, I went to Buffalo, New York to a treatment center. And I went to probably 10 before I stabilized. Do you mind if I go back because this is going to be a podcast about recovery about yeah. hope about the work that is being done about the statistics which i was shocked at you know when i when i think of uh, one fifth of our population is dealing with this there's there's a lot of people that are suffering in silence there are a lot of family members that are suffering in silence knowing that their loved one is dealing with a, a form of addiction so for you you were at 18 like what did you have was it a troubling childhood? Were there reasons where you escaped to, to drugs in the first place? So a couple of things. I, you know, I don't think everybody who develops an addiction has a troubled childhood. Um, did the people that, I, that had me as a child, did they love me? Yes. Was it healthy? No. Uh, there's a lot of uh, distress uh, that I experienced. 
uh, in childhood. That there's an adverse childhood experiences study uh, in the states that they interviewed something like fourteen thousand people that showed the outcomes of long-term health for those people relative to their experiences. And if you had three or more of these experiences, your health outcomes changed dramatically throughout your lifetime, including cardiovascular issues. So childhood experiences. Uh, it can often impact many people. It certainly impacts brain development. And so I showed a lot of symptoms that would now be considered to be traumatic symptoms at the time. I couldn't speak English. Uh, I couldn't sit still. I had a lot of behavioral stuff, and so that was, uh, in in good spirit, tried to be contained, rather than the, than understanding that I wasn't able to sit still was the issue. It wasn't that I wouldn't sit still. Were second was English a second language? No, English was a first language, but I kind of spoke gibberish, and so no one really said anything too much until I got to a certain point in public school and they took me out of the class and said they were putting me in a special class. I thought I was finally moving on and we're going to go a little faster now, and except for that's not the class they put me in. <laughs> you didn't realize that you were speaking Irish. I had no idea. Did you find that you understood everything? Yeah, I, I could read, I could understand everybody else, but nobody understood me and uh, and they just passed me on for a couple of classes, years, and then I guess suddenly somebody drew a line in the sand and said, we can't keep them here. So I went to speech therapy, which was really frustrating uh, for a young kid because uh, somebody would hold up a picture and say, can you say horse? And I would say horse, except for whatever came out of my mouth wasn't horse. And then the poor woman would say, well, no, can you say horse? And I thought, yeah. I'm saying it. <laughs> What's wrong with you, lady? Uh, so all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, my parents were unhappy, uh, they married, and uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff around that. So I don't want to, you know. No, no. You know, no. By, I, by, 18, by 18, 18. You're, you're reaching not for, you know, let's go sneak a beer. It, it, there's, it, there's much more at stake. By 18, I'm rolling in bed, rolling a joint, you know. By 19, I'm rolling a joint every day when I wake up. Are you working? Where are you getting the I worked as my entire active addiction. I used to have titles like vice president and director of operations and stuff like that. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was pretty good at playing marbles. I wasn't very good at getting there. I wasn't very good at showing up regularly. I weighed 145 pounds almost all that time. And so... Uh, I, I looked, I, I, I weighed that little for so long that people thought that's what I weighed. That you were just a I very just, thin, yeah. slender individual. <laughs> yeah. That it wasn't the, the <laughs> serious drug use that was forcing you into this. Yeah. When, when did you realize, I mean, at 19, I, I know the story of a, a friend looking at this newspaper saying, they're, they're talking about these addicts and, and, and this is us. Yeah, well, because we had, uh, I remember t turning to the same friend a, a couple of years beforehand and had told him, it's getting really bad, I don't want to share anymore. You see, and I had this high moral ground in me of what right and wrong was, and I thought not sharing was just like the worst thing you could possibly be in your life. I had no idea what was ahead of me. What do you mean by that, that you don't mean know what was ahead of you? Well, that, that, that I would... <laughs> long for the day when I thought not sharing was bad that I would cross lines I I never thought I'd cross and I would stay on the other side so long I didn't know where they were anymore it's a long way from not sharing being a, a bad behavior that you see as unacceptable to you to stealing from your mother for 20 years There was, um, I, I, I see the emotion, you know, when you're faced with the reality of what you were. Sure. And yet you were. I mean, it was just how I behaved. How you how behaved. I, versus who I was. Who I was was the guy who thought sharing was a critical component of living a good life. That's who I always was. I wasn't able to live the way I wanted to. That's the tough part. When you say sharing, what are you? 
Just that if you had bread, you'd give some to somebody, right? If you bought a chocolate bar, you'd break it in half with your friends. If you... Just just because if they didn't have any, you'd always share. But it got to the point you just... I'm not sharing anything. <laughs> not only that, but I don't have enough for me. I'll have to take something from you. So, stealing. Stealing, absolutely. So the reverse opposite of sharing. Absolutely. Did you see how far down you were going at that point? Oh, by the time I was 24, I did. By the time I was 24, it was... I could... I, I, I stayed awake the entire month of October... Uh, which is supposed to, you know, you're supposed to die after about a week. Uh, but I was awake for 30 days. And uh, when I finally... How is that possible? What are you... <laughs> I, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to conceptualize staying awake. I mean, we could we'll maybe pull an all-nighter or two. But is it the drugs that are keeping you yeah, awake? The, is the, it... The drugs... Uh, and I guess, you know, a long, long time ago I was... Uh, a tireless athlete way back when sometime somebody who could run forever and so i had a cardiovascular system that supported that somehow but i mean you know I, when i finally passed out there was uh, drugs and money and booze on the table i ran out of me before i ran out enough and that's when i woke up i realized there would never be enough for me what is that realization oh it's an endless appetite <laughs> that there isn't anything that's going to be done. And when, when I woke up, I had to actually betrayed everybody and had just done every, all the stuff, all the stuff I could imagine never doing I had done. And I started again. This point, you're 24? Yeah, 24, this experience, 25. Yeah. Is this your first time? What, what was the first time that you say, I need help? Because you just mentioned that you had tried in and out of treatments you said the number was 10 yeah so i know i know i did uh, a friend of mine once i was the first person he saw have a a nervous breakdown who recovered on his own and so i rallied around from that and worked really hard and you know uh, stabilized to some degree whatever that would look like and you are you doing this with medical help? Are you doing with how? How are you able when so many people? I mean, it's there's a craving, there's a mindset. Your your brain is thinking in a different capacity. Yeah, so you know, we manage to do, manage to try to stay on track with the things that seem not to be as harmful. So a harm reduction program and it's my own making, you know. How so, does one make their own harm reduction? Well, problem? you know, don't don't uh, don't snort any of that and uh, drink this, not that, and uh, smoke this, not that. It breaks down and falls apart, but then you've got these sort of catastrophes. And I had the ability to drive economic income, and so you know, uh, I could blow up two or three times a month, and you know, quotation marks get away with it and use something every day that I could get away with. Quotation marks. marks. What is What is get away with? Do not feel too bad when I went to bed. Right? Not. But are you getting up and going to a work where you said, you know, you have these titles? And, I mean, did people not understand or see what was happening? It was important that I worked for people who wanted to make money more than they wanted me to be well. Well, that's a statement right there. No. They People overlooked can, what was happening to you. Through kindness or fear. Hard to say which. Do you think some were kindness and some were fear? And some were absolutely greed. I made people money. They, they put up with a lot if you make them money. A, a friend of mine, and I call him a friend now, I remember I was working with him, uh, and uh, he said to me that he had enough money now. And I said, to him, well, then I can't keep working for you because that's all I bring you. And he said, yeah, that's not going to work anymore. You knew the value. I knew the value, and then if you didn't care about money more than you cared about other things, then it would be hard for me to work for you. It's interesting to have that understanding because I am wondering how you're able to get away 
being the type of ad in that situation people close their eyes i didn't get away i mean you can't i mean you can't stay up for three days crawl into work looking like you haven't eaten for three days pale as a ghost i would think that that just doesn't happen in today's day and age i mean was this happening 30 years ago because it's i can't see that it happens still today or does it so there's uh, 150,000 Canadians are homeless. You know, that's probably underreported by at least a third, so say 200,000. A lot of them simply have poverty. They don't have a mental health issue. They don't have an addiction issue. They just have poverty, which is no small thing to, 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 to grapple with. But even if the minimum active people right now with a substance use disorder in Canada or a behavioral addiction is 4.5%, that's 1.3, 1.4 million people. Where are the other 1.2 million? They are at home, they're driving cars, and they're working. It's happening all around you. It's happening all around you. Are you ever surprised, or I guess I guess you wouldn't be, by the individuals that you sometimes see now? With caps, and I'm going to get to caps and the work they yeah. do. But I, I, but I'm fascinated by this aspect of high functioning uh, individuals I, that, or at least we, the outside world sees them as high functioning. I, I hate to see them sometimes as desperate. If I get to work and I hold on to my job, two things happen. I mustn't be that bad, and I can afford another drink or another drug or another kiss or another bat. So you got those two things going on. So let me give you a scenario, and you tell me who's more desperate, who has greater despair. There's three guys on George Street right now getting ready to try to raise 10 bucks to get to the liquor store at 10 o'clock. And if they do, they're going to get a small bottle, and they'll share it, and the three of them will be kings for 15 minutes until it's time to start again. But they have companionship, mutual goal, and they'll be in on it together. And there's somebody in Rockcliffe right now who can't get out of the basement. Cars in the laneway, kids are in university. Money's in the bank. Nobody knows. Who's in greater despair? I, I'm just taking a moment to, to see this. And, and for people who aren't from here in the city, George Street is like this downtown kind of the place you don't really want to walk or go in the, you know, late at night. Yeah. And, and usually there's panhandlers trying to ask you for money on, on, on every corner. And Rockliffe is one of the highest valued neighborhoods in the city. Very wealthy. I know what my perception is of seeing these individuals constantly. Because I, I worked on George Street for... 20 years <laughs> yeah yeah right and i i can tell you at, at three four o'clock in the morning every time i got out of my car there was somebody waiting and so i i, I will be honest with you I, there's like this negative i, I don't want to it was hard for right because it was a daily consistent i i saw it and then at the same time it was troubling because you understood yeah. the need but I get the but I get when you say that there's companionship, there's three of them. There's three of them yeah. that have a common goal that are going to share and that have this companionship. It takes less time for three people to raise ten bucks for the bottle at ten o'clock than it does for one. So everybody gets a drink sooner. That's the thought process. That's the thought process. It so let's go back to Rockcliffe, though. Let's go back to the housing, the money, the family, and the position in the society does not save one from a substance use disorder. Say that again, the last part. Does not save one from a substance use disorder. No. Okay. So when we're looking at how do we help people, right, everybody's going to be different, right? There's nothing worse than a comfortable chair that offers no comfort. See, if you sit on the can curb... Can the individual, the individual from Rockcliffe yeah. and the three men on George Street, when they sit in a room together, are they seen as... How, how does... 
How do they bridge the gap? <laughs> well, there yeah. is no. They have the. They don't have. They they don't have a gap. They've got their drug or their addiction or their right. their drug right. or their drink. It, it, so you know there can be self protective behavior, right? For many people, the job and the house and the family have been their protracted wrapper to avoid having to look at their in inability to stop themselves. Right? I was always with the family. I drank three King Boys every day when I cooked dinner, but I cooked dinner with my family, except for, you know, on some emotional level, you're not present. Now, that's not my story, but it's a story of some people I know. I know a lot of stories. A lot of people have told me their story, and, and they have all one thing in common. They're not able to be with themselves, and they're not able to act how they want to act. When you hear so many of these stories, and that is the common factor, yeah. they're not able to be who they want to be. So there's an awareness. Yeah. There's an awareness in, in this. We're very logical beings, right? And so if I have tried my very best and I haven't succeeded, what's my, what do I know? I know that my very best doesn't work. And so when you suggest it, well, if they tried harder, well, they, you can't try harder than you try. You might try something different, but harder's not going to work. But different can. And different comes down to the type of health, the type of mindset, yeah. the type of recovery, I'm, assu I'm assuming. Well, and, and different comes down to a very fearful moment when you declare that you care about yourself. Because How your past experiences that caring about you hasn't mattered. How different have those people's, can I, can I use the word rock bottom? Like that, that moment of discovery that it, the, the mattering part comes into play. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Well, and I, I like to, rock bottom's a term we hear a lot around this, and I would really like to say, when did you find out that you were so sick you're going to need help? And when did you think help might work? So you can get, so the, those are two very different statements. Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think that one of our biggest problems socially is the fact that we don't educate people about what a substance use disorder is, what addiction is, uh, like we would with the measles, like we would with the other health conditions. And so how can I self-diagnose if I think that this is what substance use disorder is, and I don't have poverty, and I don't have homelessness. If I'm using that for my diagnosis criteria, then I don't qualify. And if I'm using it for my diagnosis criteria, and I'm in an upper middle class home, I won't qualify. I eh? no, I'm not that. Well, it's not that at all. It's can you stop yourself from hurting yourself? That's the diagnosis. You know. Suffering doesn't stop substance use disorder. Actually, that's how you get the diagnosis. Explain that further. Sure. So I'm trying to I'm trying to have it make sense in a logical setting, or yeah. or for or for the individual that's listening right now. Sure. So let's just focus on the word that this is a disorder. Okay. So let's not look for logic in it. Let's look for where the disorder is. So if I use the substances and my social network is starting to fall away and my physical health is starting to fall away and my financial stuff is starting to uh, be problematic. If I was healthy, I would stop that or moderate that or change that behavior because human beings move away from suffering in a normal pattern. Substance use disorder is defined by when that doesn't happen. That's the In disorder. In fact, wouldn't, as it's happening and things are getting worse, that you would turn more towards the substances because to mask the, the pain of, of, yeah. of the understanding of it? Yeah. Well, and that's the disorder of the brain uh, that is more visible now with the new uh, imagery they can do with the brain imagery. You can see the brain's been hijacked. 
and actually believes that I will die without a substance versus the substance is killing me. I will die without the substance yeah. versus the substance is killing, is killing me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you. I mean, it was a common frame in my brain, right? I will die without another piece. I'll and it's interesting because drink. you talk about how the recovery of your own brain, the years of it, of the years it's taken to have the, yeah. the recovery. So can I ask you, I mean, I, I have this understanding from 19 to 56, you, I, I'm looking at this like one massive roller coaster, right? Cause yes. you've got your highs and you've got your lows and you've got the jobs that you're keeping. And then you've got your three day binges and this yeah. is a roller coaster. Like, are you, are you ever ex like exhausted? Like that, that, you, <laughs> that, that there's a point, like, I'm just too tired to oh. go on. Like, were there those points? Oh, I, you know, most of my adult life, I think it's fair to say at least the last 20 years of my active use, death was something I sought. You know, I had a particular, I mean, I, I don't want to single anything. There was a particularly difficult summer. I can't even tell you how long ago it was now. 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, I have a little trouble with history in here. Uh, so my uh, log homestead uh, burnt. Uh, my body and my heart swell up, and I was in critical care for four days. So my basically my heart stopped being able to pump. And then uh, the because you were involved in a fire. No, like, so my, I was working down in Toronto area. Uh, the house was up in Renfrew County, so it got gutted by a fire. Okay. And it had always been the dream. Hey, I'll get to the log homestead and grow flowers and lead a peaceful life. Doesn't well, it sound unicorns wonderful? and rainbows? And yeah, yeah. All around you. One of these yep. days, Why not? I, I just got to stop smoking crack, and it'll be good. And so it gutted. Uh, two weeks later, I was in the hospital with pericarditis, which is the line in your heart swells up, so there's no room for it to beat. It took them four days to stabilize my heart, but after they heard that drugs might be involved, no one wiped my face or fed me for the next three days uh, while I laid there. I went from being surrounded by people to having people check my monitoring screen untouched for the next three days. So, you know, Were stay you aware? Were you, like, I mean, I would, I would think coming out of a surgery like that, you know, you're pretty out of it. Like, were you aware that you weren't getting the care or the touch or the... Oh, yeah. Like, no, no. Yeah. I wasn't in surgery. They were just this. trying to get the, the, the swelling okay. to go down. Okay. You know, a lot of monitoring stuff, but no surgery. And so it was a viral thing. Okay. Right? But yeah, no, I was very okay, aware. Okay, so you're very aware. Oh, yeah. Once, no, no. once there's an understanding and, from those caring for you yeah. of your background. Yeah. I came in the director of a steel uh, warehouse with 40 employees uh, and was treated with respect. And then I became that attic thing and no one touched me anymore. And, and then when I, then uh, my, the woman I'd been seeing for a couple of years had developed uh, cancer and then she died a couple months later. I'd gone into treatment to try to stabilize, to try to, be there with her and uh, and be a good friend. Uh, but when I came out, she was in the ground. So it was a difficult uh, summer. You're hospitalized. You lose, uh, you lose a girlfriend. Yeah. To an illness that you were trying to be able to care for her, and yet trying to care for yourself. Yeah. And, and here's the shocking thing. Here's wait, the, oh, wait, none of this has been shocking yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, well, and I mean this in, in full sincerity, right? I mean, it, it's... It, so when I walked into the treatment center, I called uh, to find out how she was and where she was so I could go and found out she wasn't anymore. Uh, the first thing my brain said to me, the very first thing, wasn't all shit. It was, no one can blame me now. My brain saw it as a reason to use. No one can blame me now for you going and using. Yeah. You had just gotten out of a treatment. Yeah. This was as good yeah. a reason as any. They're got to see. I. This is the. Yeah. This is the escape but I'm going to have. Yeah. Right. And is and that what you did? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And, and really, really pursued death. Really pursued death. I was. 
pursued pretty... death. Oh, yeah. No, I, I had suicidal ideation when I was 12 or 13. I've had it all my life. I still have it today. But today is a very yeah. different story because yeah. I'm going to – let's – because there's, there's, there's hope at the end of this. This is, <laughs> yeah, no, this no. is the thing is that there, there is hope. You. <laughs> You're here. Yeah. yeah. 56? Yeah. What, what, what worked? What was different this time around? Because there are people who have probably listened or who have yeah. gone through something and it's like didn't quite take. Or this time, what was it each time? This time it's going to take? This time I'm more desperate? This mm. time I'm more ready? This mm. time I have no choice? My family, everyone, I'm... No, no? I had all those. You had enough? I had thousands of those. You know, it was not, it was not uh, the consequences that got me better. That's what got me the diagnosis. What got me better was unconditional compassion understanding, new insight into what was wrong with my brain, not with me. The, the, so time, science, um, society's outlook on it maybe? I yeah. mean, because yeah. when you're 19 or and then the first time at like 24 and 56, there's, there's a lot of understanding over that 30-year, 40-year span of... of what's happening that, yeah, did no. that was that a factor well so if you so if uh i used to think you know i i couldn't seem to stop you know having relationships sometimes and uh and with nice people you know? like i'm thinking here go like who 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 are these people <laughs> getting into a relationship <laughs> with you like like <laughs> you know like i I'm, I'm hearing you say you know i could Hold a job. I mean, you're you're smoking, you're yeah, crack, I, and yet and, and you know. Quote, quote poetry and go to ballet and read books and build gardens. You could do all of that. Yeah, well, I wanted to have a good life, and I tried very very hard. And uh, I had doom stalking me, and I was convinced that doom was true. And so when it, you know. Uh, yeah, so my last day of active use. Right. Yeah, what's some? the last day? So <laughs> the last day of active use, uh, I had gotten to a treatment center down uh, my kitchen or somewhere, Stonehenge, I mean. Maybe the druids that helped me was the idea. Uh, anyways, I got 33 days uh, of abstinence for the first time in 25 years, and I held on the chip so tight I snapped it in half. You made it 33 days? 33 is days. There, what is the significance of 33 days? Well, any day. I mean, I couldn't make it a day at that point, you know. Uh, so when I got there and stayed for 33 days, it was really, you know, it's, a, it's enough abstinence to scare you to death. Because if you make it, two things, two things. Eh? If you make it, well, I've got my past, don't I, to live with. And if everybody's hopes come up one more time, and I'm going to hurt them all one more time, isn't it better to get it over with? And if my hopes come up one more time, do I want to go through that loss again? So take me back to like day four and then day 12 and then day 18 that you're able for the first time to get to this 33-day and this, this word of hope or possibility, well, does it, did it change? Like, how how did you not be able to do that other times and yet make it this far? Well, I always made it through treatment. I was pretty good when I got the treatment, you know. I, I was pretty hungry, so I ate a lot, and slept a lot. And, you know, they were nice folks in treatment, so they met well. There, I remember leaving treatment center one time, and, and I came home to the woman I was living with. She was crying in the door with a letter in her hands. The treatment center had written her and told her I wasn't going to make it, and she should get away from me. The treatment center knew. Well, did they? Did they know? The letter. They, 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 can say they made what, sure at that point that's, that. That's right. But did they know? They did not. It's not what we would call health care. 
Yeah. If it, if our past told us whether we're going to make it or not, none of us would make it. 23 million people in North America are living in recovery from a substance use disorder. Lots of us make it. Lots of us make it. What stops us from making is we don't think we're going to, and neither does most of the world. And we have an experience that says it's true, and we have a society with an attitude that agrees with our experience. And so we're locked in this conversation of that's what they're like. No, no, that's what I've done. Change the experience. Change the experience. So what really changed for me was I had met a doctor when I got discharged from that treatment center, came to Ottawa, went to the Royal Ottawa Hospital, uh, got in the day program there a couple hours a day, went in every day, announced that I'd used again. And they would always say, well, can you still be in the bottle, Mr. Garner? And I had this is really low, low level of trust here because I just told you that I used and now you want to make sure I'm not lying about that. So anyways, two weeks later, they pulled me and another gentleman out and announced that they were discharging us because we'd been using every day. And I said, well, yeah, that's actually why I'm coming here. And that's, I told you I was. And that's why I'm here. Well, I'll have to leave. Anyway, so we got discharged. Uh, he and I both got married this fall. Uh, when the gentleman got, that you were doing this with. Yeah. So um, then they were supposed to put me on a list to get called in. My uh, much younger friend had a seizure. And so they got him in earlier and they didn't call me in. And, I finally called up an angry one day and said, how come you're not bringing me to the hospital? And they said, well, aren't you okay? I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, every time you call, Gord, I ask you how you are, and you say you're good. Which, of course, is what I've been telling everybody since I was 18. I didn't even hear it anymore. I couldn't even tell somebody. I was living in a utility shed at the time. I wasn't very good. But you were saying, oh, I'm good. Yeah. What did what what did you have to say differently? Well, I said no, I'm not good, and then I got an appointment, and uh, so I bought three a balls, a bottle of whiskey, and smoked like that. So okay, that's, wait, so you got the appointment. I got the appointment. You went and purchased three eight balls and a bottle of whiskey. So that's about a half ounce of coke, and crack. And the idea being that, uh, you know, there's a good, still a good shot I could die before I had to go in and fail again. And so I didn't die. Uh, and so the next afternoon, uh, I was out of booze and out of dope, and the appointment was time. And so I got the great plot. I thought, I know I'll go to Hampton Park and get a bottle of whiskey, and I'll drink my way to the hospital. And so I did that, I got to Hampton Park, and I made a phone call, and the guy was never home in the day, he was home, it was like a miracle, so I went and got some dope, and then I was in a taxi with some dope and some booze going by in the hospital, and I asked the guy to stop the car, and I stuck the booze in the bushes and the coke in the washroom outside the doctor's office and presented myself to him. Challenge basically challenged him. Right? You agree okay, thing. here, <laughs> take me. This is, <laughs> this is what you got. This is yeah. You, you're gonna do something with this. You, Good yeah. luck with Good all luck with of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he gave me a standing ovation. He stood up and ran around his desk and clapped his hands and jumped up and down and asked me how I had managed to make it. And then he said, "Oh, I know. You must have some left. Otherwise, you would have never got here." And he said, well, look, if you don't die, come back in the morning and I'll bring you into the hospital. You made it. And I didn't die and I came to the hospital. But that moment, I realized, and that was actually my very best at that moment in my life, just to get to the hospital, and regardless of the condition I was in, that was an incredible effort for him to know that, to treat that with the respect it deserved. That started the difference. It's like you are the most, it's like when a kid is having a tantrum. And it's, you know, that they're just the, the more fired up. I mean, when you talk about how much you consumed and purchased and made your, your detours to other places to pick up more, and you still managed to get there. So if I'm sleeping on the street tonight and tomorrow night I 
get into a doorway. I'm in a recovery process. I'm showing an optimism and a self-care that I didn't have the day before when I slept on the street. So when we're in those places, because our experience is one of dismay, we have in fact done our very best. Every one of us with a substance use disorder has done their very best up to this moment. No one wants to have a bad life. I just feel sometimes people want to escape it. No one wants to have a bad life, but oftentimes people are escaping their life for this. All right, so that's still an attempt to have a better life. Even by escaping. Even by escaping, sometimes that's the only option a child has, eh? How do you get away from this? If I can't get out of the house, will I escape in my mind? Right? This is why we get people years later realizing they have abuse issues. How come you didn't remember before? Well, I escaped, eh? Not really. And it's a, it's a strategy of the brain sometimes. So soothing, people are trying to be okay, people are trying to survive, it's just it's all upside down on their head, right? And I mean that with their brains, right? Yeah. Can we go into that a little bit? Because sure. I know that you've studied and learned and, underst and understand what has happened. I mean, and, and even on the course with your own, your own brain. Yeah. So the system gets hijacked so that it actually speaks the language of the chemistry and the chemistry set decides that alcohol and drugs are how I survive. My feelings and my memories and my fears will kill me. And so you hear people say, I can't stand this. And they're in a treatment center, sitting in a chair. And it's intolerable for them. And they'll run out the door and we'll use it again. What do, you, what, do you, what do they can't stand? Well, it's nothing rational. It's their feelings or it's their fears. Can, and so I... I okay, it, I want to yeah. ask you because I... Sure, you, you know, Could you feel the... Like, I'm going to try to put this in layman's turn because I don't know the scientific, but yeah. could you feel like your brain chemistry changing as sobriety, as it left your system, as the recovery became more intense. Like, you know, sometimes like you just, you, you can feel like, I don't know what's with me. Like, right. I can feel my brain sometimes and the thoughts and the negativity or things like it, it takes, it's like this, like the sponge that's kind of being pushed in, you yeah. know, but could you feel it almost? Okay. Let me do that. It's like the sponge that's kind of getting pushed in. And then as it's slowly releasing, you kind of feel a shift, you feel a change, you feel a release. It's is there like, that feeling? Is there something like that that well, you go through? Yeah, Yeah. I, I mean, the first period of time when I first stabilized, you know, I never thought I'd make it. I mean, uh, why would I think I was going to make it? And that didn't make any sense, right? So, um, but I was afraid I wouldn't die, right? If I thought I was going to die, I would have relapsed. But I was afraid it was, you know, I was too more afraid of living than of dying. Because at this point, you've you've cheated death so many times. It's just like I I can't even die. Well, the, the, so the, I might as well, <laughs> if I'm gonna live, I'm I'm, I'm listening yeah. to your stories where like you shouldn't be here. Well, well the like on a number you, of occasions, you, you shouldn't know, be here. You know, the doctor said you don't think that stuff would kill you, and I said I've been smoking crack for thirty years. Promises, promises. <laughs> I've been waiting for death for a long time. You know, so, so once you're scared of the fact that I'm, I'm yeah. here, I'm, I'm living. Yeah. You know, um, uh, how do you let better? What, 1918 wrote the song, right? Cocaine's for horses. It ain't for men. The doctor says it'll kill me, but he won't say when. So that experience wasn't just mine. It's an old experience of people in active addiction find no, the death is not that friendly sometimes. What has, you know, holding on to this chip in the 33 days and the having this good doctor and the, and the hope and the possibility and believing in the possibility? Because I think that's, that's the shift in the mindset is, is the possibility. Yes. What if I didn't know what was going to happen for sure? Right. Just enough doubt to not be so sure that my doom was right and that my past will repeat. The biggest doors I could get to walk through. What if I could just be wrong about that? 
what would happen then. And so if I wasn't going to relapse, what would I do today? What did you do that day? Well, I started hanging around with a bunch of people who had success. Right? I didn't like them. I thought they were mostly stupid. Uh, I, I, you know. Why would you like them? I mean, <laughs> you know. They came out the other side. I won't even begin to tell you what I thought about foolish people keeping in shape and doing exercises. No. <laughs> you looked at me, you're like, I'm not I'm not doing a workout today. I mean, so, right. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. just to the total extreme, right? And yeah. People that actually invest in their health. I mean, why on earth would you do that, right? So, yeah. So I was coming from a long way off the beaten path. Uh, and so what I did is I, I, I didn't want to do a lot of things. Uh, and I realized that that was actually my addiction. That was my disorder speaking. Because it, when I went to these peer groups, it felt like I was going to die. I couldn't stand listening to this nonsense. And um, so. You I, didn't see yourself in any of these people? And No, not for a while. You know, they were optimistic, some of them. Some you of them. hated that? Ah, you know. And a harsh cynicism uh, taught to me by my experiences with myself and with others. So what happens in these meetings that you just start to hate them less or that you actually listen? Like how, because there's people that are going to these meetings and hating sitting there and hating the other people the, around this table, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, they realize that, I, you know, somebody mentioned to me that I hadn't known any of these people all my life. So it wasn't likely they were my problem. And so, but my problem might be not being able to sit with people, sit through my displeasure, emotional tolerance, right? And so I started going to these meetings not uh, for what the meeting offered, but for the opportunity to practice emotional tolerance. Emotional tolerance. Yeah. You were pra you were you were going to these meetings for emotional to practice emotional tolerance. Yeah. There's one meeting. It was a. Uh, Somebody said something I didn't agree with one time, and I rattled my chair around and stomped off to the washroom and came back, and I thought, I'm going to die because I can't let somebody just speak and not make it all about me and not judge them. And when did I become so ugly? I mean, I was so hateful. I had, I had no idea. I, I got dimples, for heaven's sake. I had become this hateful human being who couldn't tolerate others judge them without mercy don't you feel like I, I like that's what people were doing to you yeah. i would, I would <laughs> you think, <would> think <laughs> for the you most would part. think at this point <laughs> yeah yeah no know? no they, and okay so family members or yeah. were there friends that actually had stood by you well were, i think some of my friends that stood by me locked the door on me they just stood by the part of me that they knew this one's not that anymore, but we want that, not this. Have have the people that did close the door on you have have they have they met you now? Yeah, it, it uh, for the first time. I, I mean, I used to get better for four weeks at a time, sort of thing, then run around and tell everybody I was okay now. But and we know that didn't work because you you did that. Yeah, then it's okay. Here's fifty bucks and let me a hundred and. <laughs> So that didn't work, but so this time I didn't try to get back. I mean, there's this uh, beautiful drawing of the pit of despair that suggests that the way out of the pit isn't back. The person at the other side always comes into the pit. And it's through and then emerge into a new place that's never been before. So instead of trying to go back, which I always want to go back to this. You fashion, always went back. I always went back. This time I didn't try to go back and I waited to see if I was healthy who would cross my path in my new life. And you know That's a that's a pretty profound statement or image to to think of or to to think through. Yeah. You had to go through and most people, right? When they're going through it, you have to go through it. You, you gotta go through it. This, this is my life. It's a true story. All my experiences are true. I did all those things, all those things were done to me. All that's true, there's no magic place before. And the person, the truth was, the young guy who started this way and fell in, 
was always going to start this way and fall into something because I wasn't well at the time. And I had a mental um, substitute. So can you think the right word? Vulnerability to addiction. You know. So when I took my first drink, I didn't t pick up a drink and say, oh, here's to a life of alcoholism and addiction. No, I had a drink because everybody at the bar was having a drink and the band was playing. And I wanted to be with everybody. Right. But those people went home after having their two drinks and carried on with their day. You, there, yes. there was a vulnerability there that there was always going to be more than the one. That's right. So to go back would be to yeah. be the vulnerable person right. again. And not to recognize who that was. No, you've gone through. So okay. you go through. Yeah. Some people come down in the pit and mm -hmm. follow you on this, on this new path. What have, the, what have the relationships been like with some of these people that can appreciate who you are now? Um, good. I mean, some of them, it's, it's funny. And some of them we touch base again and express their love and affection. And then our lives just are busy in different areas. So we don't see each other now because we're doing different things, but not because we're not talking to each other. And uh, one friend in particular, actually the guy who locked the door, uh, I, it took a while uh, because, you know, as he said, Gord, you always told us you're okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> what are we supposed to believe, right? And so, which was true enough, right? And, uh, and then I asked him one day, you know, was there was a particular amount of money or was there a particular thing that I had done that somehow there was something I could do? And he said, well, you were supposed to be my friend. You're supposed to go to the game together. Right? Be my friend. And so I was looking, I was doing all this volunteer work in good cause stuff, right? And I realized, so well, I can't do all that and be a friend to my friends. So I'll have to stop volunteering. So I got space in my life to be a friend with my friend. And so we do stuff together. We go to some lacrosse games. We hang out and laugh and enjoy each other's company. This was someone that you had stolen money from, yeah. time, everything. Everything. When you got approached, how did, because I know you've had lots of different jobs with nice fancy titles and I have no concept of how you were able to maintain these titles, but I do understand the greed part of those that overlooked it. <laughs> how did this organization, how did CAPSA, how did all of this come to be so that you are now in the position of helping others? Uh, so I had gone, I went back to school uh took an addictions and trauma course so i could be how, how old are you at this point when i graduated at 60. uh <laughs> yeah no i'm smiling because it's possible it's a true There's story possibly okay at 60. at 60. uh so i was working full-time as an addictions counselor and uh did you trust what did you trust about yourself that you could be this this counselor and listening to other people's stories and not seeing yourself in it or having a, a trigger uh, in it. So, um, is that a fair question? I'm it, sorry. No, it okay. is. I think it's an important question, and I, I want to. I'm, I'm sorry to pause, but I want to give an accurate, as accurate answer as I can. So, the first six or seven months of my stabilization, uh, which for me included the uh, abstinence. Um, I really didn't think I was going to make it. Uh, and I thought it was just a question of time. And then slowly but surely, one moment happened and nothing happened and another moment happened. And I started thinking, geez, I, I might be able to make it. And I, I had always had this story that if I stabilized, I go back and I keep the money this time, eh? And so I was getting ready to uh, get my resume together and see if I could go run back and get some money. And I ran into this old guy, uh, a hateful person, really, when I think about it. Anyways, he said to me, uh, now that you've got your sobriety, are you going to stay and help others? Or are you going to go have your little life? And... Uh, uh, how do you know I was planning on going to have in my little life? And then uh, he suggested to me that if I had come to treatment and come to peer groups, 
to take sobriety, to take handshakes, to take pats on the back. And I left us having taken all I could get. What had changed? Was I not still just a taker? Was I not still just concerned with myself above all others? And that if I didn't change, I was pretty sure I was going to die. Wasn't such an old, awful man. No, it's kept me busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's kept you very busy. It's kept me very busy. And so I, I did the absurd. I took a part-time job for $12 an hour, guaranteed eight hours a month. That was my return to work. Uh, and it was at a treatment center I used to live at. And so I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like living on OW and making a hundred bucks a month part time and trying to tell somebody that's a success story. It was for me though. And then so I went to school. I didn't want to go to school because who wants to owe money late in life? Like I, I don't, I don't owe money all my life, but somehow I was uh, righteous, you know? So, uh, and anyways, the school system seemed to understand my credit rating. So they gave me a grant instead of a loan. And wow. Yeah. So, and then I just, uh, I kept marching, riding the buses to go from college, riding, going to work. At 60, when you've got the 19 year olds that, you know, <laughs> sitting down, like, yeah. did they ask you questions? Did they? Well, yeah. I mean, there's that whole thing of coming from a, a, a place of lived experience. We can sometimes be seen as that, you know? And so. I don't think I'm a good counselor because I used to drink and drug. I, I think I'm a good counselor because I understand what was wrong with be, me and the feelings involved and the desperation involved and the self-disappointment involved so that I can bring optimism and hope to those and people. Optimism, hope. And I've yeah. seen that quite a bit on the website or what, you're, what you do with um, the organization. So how critical is that? And does it extend beyond... The, the individual themselves, but to family and friends and, and their support systems, yep. if hopefully they have them. Well, well my brother uh, made a post last night on Facebook. I, I was at the United Nations Drug Commission in Vienna. Uh, my brother went on and made some comment about how he'd always knew I could be like this and held hope for me. You were, okay. Yeah. I did see this on Facebook. Here you are speaking yeah. in Vienna. Yes. In front of a, a well-educated, well-paneled, interesting, diverse group. Yeah. Could you have said to your 24-year-old self, 35-year-old self, your 44-year-old self, I'm going to be speaking at this conference about addiction? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. You know. What did it mean to travel there and represent? I mean, I know you were there as almost like a Canadian delegate for this. Well, I mean... It, again, I think the challenge was, you know, that uh, compassion is such a big part of this. And that uh, if I look back at all the people who tried to help me the way they tried to help me, uh, it wasn't that they didn't want to help me. Maybe they didn't know how to help me. Uh, and that uh, I don't want to go around and be unkind to folks. I think people are fearful sometimes around substance use. My behaviors are true. It is a true story. I don't want to be not responsible for the things I did. I, you know, um, but I. But how how can people then educate themselves? Because you said people were there to help. They just didn't know. Well, we didn't have the neuroscience before, so you couldn't see the change in brain activity. You couldn't see the primal brain on fire and the frontal cortex turned off, basically. Uh, I used to watch the, you know, the Titanic. I won't wreck the ending, but I'm, you know, about the boat, right? And Pretty sure we got that concept. For, yeah. Okay. So I, when I was a kid, I saw the movie on TV, and I wanted to play in the band. Eh? I wanted to be one of those noble people in the band. Eh? That played as the ship was sinking. Yeah. Wow. Eh? Who wants to be like that? Yeah. And uh, it turns out I was one of those people throwing kids out of the life raft while the boat sank. <laughs> right. You didn't. I didn't know, right? I lost control of my brain and of my behaviors. But I hadn't lost the person who wanted to play in the band. I lost the ability to act the way I hoped to act and how I wanted to act. 
is giving that reference to family members or supporters, um, a support system, that understanding that this is this is who they see themselves as. Yeah. I think it's important for family members to model well-being, right? So if someone's taking things from you, lock your door, that's well. It's, but that's about you being well, not about, against them. So we don't have to have behaviors in our homes that, that we wouldn't accept from others, but I think we need to realize that the person's behaviors reflect the disorder, not the person. But I mean, I I mean, I've done events and I've I've heard speakers and, uh, and I know right now with the uh, the fentanyl, you know, use uh, not use, but like the the scare and the opioids, yeah. it's it's happening with people so much younger who never anticipated reaching for these drugs in hopes of soothing or, you know, yeah. these families are finding themselves in the most difficult of situations trying to conceptualize what's happening to their loved one and especially to the younger kids that are getting involved in this. I, I, can't, I can't imagine that you think you're not helping the right way when you're trying to offer them all the resources that are available. Well, so personally, I think that very much what CAPS is trying to do is demonstrate the right way to help, demonstrate that uh, this isn't about separate communities, this isn't about uh, any individuals, this is about all of us. When we talk about the numbers, if you look at who's affected by substance use disorders, who's affected by addiction, so if there's even 4.5% active right now, it's 1.3 million, 1.4 million Canadians, if they know seven people, that are so no, okay so i'm looking at this yeah. so like even uh, all people all pathways yes right this is this is part of it i've been on the website yeah all people all pathways yes. what do you want people to read into that that the door is open and that we don't have a set way for you to move forward but we believe that you can we just want you to be able to come in the door and be with other people headed in the same direction as you so that optimism can be gained from the others you might not have it yourself. How do the programs work? So all people, all pathways. Uh, the Wednesday night meeting is uh, usually an entry point meeting for a lot of people. We do th three really simple practices. Uh, when people first get in there, we give them a piece of paper and a pen and crayons, and they can write to themselves or draw a line to themselves, including a line to the paper that says journaling is stupid. Uh, my favorite journal entry because it, it gets me in touch with my emotions and my thinking and nothing bad happens. I'm still just sitting in a chair. If substance use disorder is a constant self-abandonment of my experience, and then by journaling or drawing a picture about how I'm feeling, I'm connecting with my experience. So it would be a reverse activity from a, a active addiction. The other thing is we know uh, scientifically when we hold a pen that a different part of my brain lights up than it was working before. So if I'm trying to change my mind, one of the ways to do that is by activating different areas. Then we do a check-in, uh, which is kind of a serve and return, which is just neuroscience saying, hi, hello, back, we see you. And this total acceptance of whoever's there and whatever situation they're in. Different we, we, backgrounds, different ages, different everything. Who's, sure. who's at these meetings? Uh, well, we've got parents, we've got uh, siblings, we have people in active substance use, we have people with two or three years of absence, we have people with concurrent issues. We, we don't care how you are today, we care that you got to group today because you got to group today that expresses an optimism that there is help. You talk about collaborations and partnerships. Yeah. So uh, we work uh, extensively with the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. We have a series of workshops we've done across the country. Uh, we're going down to Barrie next month. Uh, so that's evidence-based, uh, and one of the reasons we knocked on that door and developed that relationship, uh, of course it takes two parties to have a relationship, was we wanted to have evidence-based. We didn't want to just have our stories. We wanted to have the evidence of best practices and to move this forward that way. It's a paper world, and you need to have evidence to have contact. The other thing, Canadian Mental Health Association of Ottawa, uh, we work with them as well because lots of our members have co-concurrent issues. And then uh, we have Recovery Day Ottawa in September where we have over 50 community partners with information tables and plus 13 or 14 peer support groups with their information as well. It's gonna be great. 
When is that? So for people, that's September thirteenth. Mark it in your calendar. People can head to the website uh, capsa.ca. C A P S A, right? Did I say that right? C A P S A. Yes. Capsa.ca. Yes to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Your brain's back. It, it's yeah. it, it, it's kind of moving that way. I I mentioned something about the running shoes. Sure. I I should uh, you know there's there's these multicolored. I think actually are those Sockneys? They're Asics. They're Asics. Okay. Yeah. 2010. What? You've been wearing those are some old sneakers. No, uh, they made them in 2010, which happens to be when I stabilized, and I. Uh, when I first stabilized, I didn't have any resources, and so I had bought a pair of uh, red Monopoly shoes, two sizes too big for 15 bucks. And so, uh, in treatment, everybody signed the shoes and stuff, and I couldn't keep wearing them for very long. And so when I when I got through there, someone was kind enough to buy a new pair of shoes, and these were them. And so I liked them a lot. And people uh, would look down at them. I would start talking at, at withdrawal management centers and treatment centers, and people's heads were down because they were kind of still beaten up. And they wouldn't remember me or anything I said, but they remembered the they shoes. They remember your shoes. People looking down. Like they, yeah. they didn't want to look up. They didn't want to make eye contact. Yeah. Despair, embarrassment. Absolutely. Yeah. Depleted. Yeah. But they looked down and they saw your shoes. Saw the shoes. Pretty friendly shoes, and then they would see the shoes again. And what I had mostly told them was that I had found a way to stay okay. And so when they saw the shoes and I was still okay, then my message was a little truer. Is okay easier to handle than, like, I'm still okay? Usually when you say, hi, how are you doing? And someone says, okay, it's like, well, just okay. <laughs> someone says, how are you doing? I'm, I'm great, you know, but okay, you can handle. Well, isn't uh, that a great platform to go off on? Right. So I, I used to judge my well-being by my momentary feelings or my momentary thoughts rather than my physical safety and or some what people call my actual experience. So my experience is I'm just sitting in a chair and there's nothing scary happening in reality. I'm under no physical threat, so I'm okay. And I can I can be happy or I can be sad. That's how do I feel? That's different from how I am. I'm, I'm okay. How do I feel? Well, I'm happy today. It's great to be with you. When you get up now in the mornings, like the alarm goes or you wake up, like can you kind of give me your first couple of thoughts of the day? Well, can I go to when I go to bed at night? When I go to bed at night, I don't hate myself. I don't have the replays of my history in my head anymore. And the horror shows. That doesn't happen. And when I wake up, I'm glad to be alive. You know, my mind still would betray me if it's unattended. My, my mind. Like so, there's still constant work. Oh like, yeah, my like brain thinks it's a good day to die. But you're okay today. I am, but I'm okay today. My brain can think what it wants. I have no intention of dying today. But you realize that this will be every day. There will be you'll. You need to do the work. I don't know how my story ends. Huh? My, I, have a, I have a substance use disorder and I have suicidal ideation. And so on a daily basis, you know, one of those voices is going to speak to me and see if I want to listen or not. And so if I don't continually practice changing my mind, if I don't continually practice a way of... Uh, ruling my life through my heart and through my intentions versus through my thoughts and my f feelings, uh, I may be susceptible. And how does that happen? Well, I don't know what door I might walk through someday and, and re-traumatize myself through a moment or what experience may come back and grab me someday. Uh, so I, I, a, lot of, a lot of my friends have died this last year. So it's been a sad year that way. But you understand the shift in your mindset, that your that your thought process mm -hmm. when you go through that is changing. You've you've visualization practice. Yes, practice. This practice. didn't happen overnight. This didn't happen overnight. But if I ever got sick again, I would hope that I don't die from shame. 
I think you will have inspired too many people to do that. The people, like you're dealing with so many of these people every day, trying to give them this hope. You can't think that. I'm like, you can't think that way, Corey. <laughs> no, you've got too many people. Do not do you not feel that pressure a bit? Like you, you, well, you... that's why I'm building a, a platform for me that to say I'm living with this, right? You know, I have no desire to be ill again. But if I got ill again, I do not want to die from self hatred. And as a voice for the recovery community, as a voice for reducing stigma, right? Will I die from stigma if I got sick again, or would I just go to the hospital and say, "Hey, something happened. I'm sick again." I'm going to thoroughly diagnose substance use disorder that tells me that I'm vulnerable to irrational thoughts that I believe are true sometimes. And I've done everything I can to not have this happen. I will have done that. So far, it hasn't happened. I'm really glad. No, I, you're, you're I don't want it to happen. Trust me. I don't want it to happen. And you've got a wife. You've got, you've got other people. Yeah. I, you. Yeah. Well, and I had all those before, too, and it never kept me well. <laughs> I never, that, they never kept me well. This is a brain disorder. And I do everything I can to keep my brain well, including change my mind regularly, including doing this, right? Because my brain would say, hunker low, right? Don't get too close to the sun, right? Well, this is, this is an hour plus of you opening up and really having to, I, I would assume it's probably difficult. Like for me, it's fascinating and it's a story. And for you, it's having to relive moments and thoughts uh sure. and truth yeah no i've got some sad stuff in my life that's true and is, i have a good is there anything that, that you find this could is healing or that there's one individual that's listening to this that could go okay it could be okay yeah well, i mean i think everybody that's suffering from substance disorders can have a better life i'm not sure what that looks like for them what their path is but I am convinced that they can have a better day tomorrow than they're having today. And uh, I would rather be right than be wrong about that. And they'll have to decide. But, um, you know, it is a brain disorder, so we can't always listen to ourselves about the answer. But Science is catching up. Science is catching up. And uh, are, you, are we talking about learn, laugh, listen? Is that okay? Go for it. This Saturday, learn, laugh, listen at the Bronson Center. This will have already passed. It will have already passed. It will have already passed. Is there any editing available? <laughs> Is there any editing available? No, but I'm going to have up the website <laughs> oh. so that people are going to know okay. um, that there are programs, that there are a lot of things that are underway. Great. But if they, it, but to know what, what did they miss? What did you miss? Well, you missed some uh, language training uh, and some evidence based around the harms that language does. There's a great study out of the United States that, in, that uh, surveyed health professionals with two case studies. In the one case study, they used the term drug abuser. In the other case study, they used the term a person with a substance use disorder. 76% of the people in the one case study said punishment is the route to go. In the other one, 76% of the people thought that treatment was the way to go. When they were referred to? As a person with a substance use disorder. Language Change the language. Change the language. We got to that one right off the top, so <laughs> happy about that. Gord, thank you so much. CAPSA, uh, C-A-P-S-A dot C-A if you're looking for more information. Uh, and to be able to, from whichever background you're at, there's an outlet there. There's someone to be able to talk to and have the right programs that, that, that they have in mind. I really appreciate you sharing your story. I'm glad that you're here. And I hope some more people see the shoes and look up. <laughs> I hope nice they plan. do that. Thank you. And that's a wrap on this episode of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. Uh, if you have the ability, there's so many different topics that we've been hitting on. Like, share, subscribe, let people know that uh, we've got a number of things here that are, that are really affecting, hopefully, our everyday lives and ways to make our lives better. Have a great one.